It's time to start the show. to go with the it's 420 somewhere podcast with your host with the most the man voted most likely to smoke out with a yeti mr brian brown mr brian brown now sit back and relax because it's time to go live across the world because it's 420 somewhere What's up, what's up, what's happening, guys? That's right, it's 420 somewhere, guys, and I am your host, Brian Brown, and we are live from Desert Dream Studios, that's right, in beautiful Golden Valley, Arizona, coming to you live for once uh, <clears throat> from the studio, going to try to do these a lot more, guys, um, which, that's better, um, Oh, man, how is everyone's True Crime Thursday going, guys? Hey, if it's your first time watching what this is, this is a podcast where we count down to 420, Monday through Friday. At 410, we start, and we get into a whole mess of trouble in the meantime, guys. We do movie Mondays where we do movie reviews. We have stars come on and talk about the movies. We give away stuff from the movie. Um, We have, uh, what, Paranormal Tuesday where we get into all sorts of crazy stuff in the Mojave Desert, camel spiders, oh my god, in the Mojave Desert, UFOs, Bigfoot, um, we do Weed Wednesday, where we do uh, um, weed reviews, we do strain reviews, we do uh, stuff that stoners love, we get into conspiracy theories, and we do True Crime Thursday, guys, and don't forget, Baked and Unboxed at 420 on Fridays, to give you a chance to win something really, really cool, as we unbox some of the coolest stuff in the history had known the man that is right um and today guys is true crime thursday and we got a good one i don't know if it's a crime yeah i'm gonna say it's a crime we are looking at the dark side of pt barnum my whole life growing up i was that generation that just missed it we just missed it i tell a story um i'll tell it real quick you know what i'll save it I'll save it for when we uh, when we get into the whole P.T. Barnum deal. But what we also do, guys, 
is we also count down to 420 every day, but we also do the top five at 420. <laughs> um, what this is, guys, is we uh, scour the Internet. We spend our days looking for the funniest, most humorous videos for you guys, the biggest fails um, per se, and today we got a good one. We, you know, it's a new year, new me. Everyone's working out. Everyone's getting fit. A lot of people don't know how. And when they get on a treadmill, you would think it would be uh, pretty basic, right? Uh-uh-uh. These guys are going to prove us all wrong. These are the top five epic treadmill fails, guys. Here we go. And... Poof goes the dynamite. That's right, guys. The top five at 420 brought to you by the Healing Center, 1400 Needles Highway, Needles, California. Wild weekly deals are dropped. Check them out, guys. Uh, DailyDank.com. Boys, kids trucking. Save some green on some green. And he's going, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. We need to see that again. And this is slow motion. Oh my god. That kid is trucking. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> I love the noise of the skid. And BAM! Oh ho ho! Oh ho ho! Alright, number four guys. Kid's doing pretty good. He's going. He's trucking. Oh, those little legs. Those little legs. <laughs> oh, that was smart. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> he was hanging. He was hanging. Don't. You better not do it slow. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta see that again. <laughs> I love the voices in slow mo. Boop boop. Oh, she got two steps and it kicked her off. <laughs> All right, guys, we got number two. This ain't gonna end well. Oh, <laughs> I see that in slow motion. You know what? When I first saw this, I thought these guys were scientists. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, I can ate it hard. Hardcore, man. Oh. All right, number one, guys. Oh, this is so worth it. This had me cracking up when I was editing, guys. This is number one by far. What? Boom. We gotta watch that again. If you blinked, you missed it. Watch this. I love this so much. Come on, buddy. Go for it. Here he goes. And he has that one friend. <laughs> that was your top five of 420. Brought to you by the Healing Center, guys. Oh, check out those ounce deals this week. All right, here's some bonus rounds. Look, she looks like a trooper. She's hanging in there. Oop. Oh, shit. Oh, 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 that hurt. Oh, on that first. I mean, I mean, I could work out all day, and obviously I'm a, I'm a <laughs> myself. Um, what was that? That dude just tripped. <laughs> oh, holy crap. Oh. And last but not least. <laughs> That's what you get for fucking around at Planet Fitness, sir. We take our gym membership seriously at Planet Fitness. How dare you fool around on the treadmills? Ruin it. That's how come we can never have nice things. <laughs> All right, guys. Get ready to blow up those comments because it's getting close to 7, 720. <laughs> getting close to 420, guys. We're counting down. What's everyone getting into, guys? I got mine loaded, and I'm getting into a little master kush. That's right. I went read up yesterday, guys. Oh, man. Um, I'm on that master kush right now, but they got some really fire deals. Um, they got the, the big, oh, what did they call it? The big nugs. <coughs> An ounce. I think it was like $140 ounce. Um, 
big nugs, big giant nugs, guys. Um, so I'm going to be getting into that. I, uh, I got a, you know, I mixed around a little bit. But guys, whatever you're getting into, get those dab rigs, get those pipes, get whatever you are getting into, and blow up those comments and let me know what is the Kingman crew getting into today. What is everyone getting into, guys? The usual suspects. Blow it up because it's for twenty. <laughs> How's everyone's 420, man? You know it's good when you got the bong sweats. Have my gravity bong out here at the studio and haven't seen it in a minute. Ooh, I'm happy. I'm ha- <laughs> oh, I've missed it. I've missed it. So, guys, how was your 420, guys? Blow up those comments. Let me know. Um, oh, man, what were you smoking? What were you getting into, guys? What would you recommend for today's true crime thursday guys um i'm excited about this one we're talking about pt barnum on this true crime thursday That's right. True Crime Thursday, guys. We got production value and everything. All right, guys. So, P.T. Barnum. We all know Barnum and Bailey Circus, uh, the, probably the biggest circus in the world, um, at least in the United States that I know of. It was always uh, that. That was the brand, man. Um, they would have the big commercials. I have two stories before we get started. So, my generation missed out on the sensationalism i think we were getting into a society of more aware um you know the things that people could pass off as grifts or whatever they did before couldn't really pass a lot but i was like at that tail end and i remember being about nine to eleven years old and my dad and mom taking me to a circus is a beautiful bullhead city arizona over uh it was actually behind oh behind the family dollar over by Smith's. It was just all vacant back there. Uh, it was all just land before it was all... Anyway, if people don't know what I'm talking about, you're just keeping it local, Brian. Go regional. Go worldwide. Don't talk local. Anyway, the circus came to town like it did every person's town. And I remember we were walking by. And I maybe I was 7 to 10. Like I wasn't old enough to really voice what I wanted. And I remember getting there and it was all crowded and people and it was oh, you know, a little kid and we walked by the freak show. This had to be the last years of the freak show. Now this wasn't Barnum and Bailey cuz they didn't come to Bullhead. <laughs> I'm just saying back then no. Um but they had a freak show and I wanted the like I just couldn't, like, tell my dad, freak show, freak show, like, I want to go. And I never got a chance to experience a real freak show. And I know in today's culture, you're like, well, maybe you shouldn't encourage that, Brian. But you know what? At one time, it was a thing, and I would have loved to experience it. And I'm always bummed about that. And that's what brings us to Barnum, uh, P.T. Barnum. 
and his showmanship and the outrageousness and straight up crimes, guys. Straight up fraud, if you really want to talk about it. And there's a murder and all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, you're talking the carny life, you know, um, back uh, back in the day, too. Um, one I really remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, is uh, who remembers um, the unicorn? I think it was the last uh, Barnum and Bailey big thing that they did. Let me turn to make sure my phone's off here. Um, it was the last thing they did. And I remember I was like in sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade. We have a real unicorn. Oh, my God. And everyone freaked out. And it was like a whole thing. It was commercials. Well, PETA and a few other uh, animal rights organizations got involved. And they found out that it was a white horse that they had glued a horn on its head or did unhumane things. And that didn't last long. So that was like it was the, the dying days of the true carny um, atmosphere. So that's what we're going to get into today, guys. The life and crimes of P.T. Barnum and uh, the fraud and the different things that happened. And, you know, take it with a grain of salt, guys, because it was that time. It was that place. Um, you just kind of kind of roll with it. And uh, not take it too seriously. But we're going to learn all about the dark side of P.T. Barnum. Here we go, guys. In doing so, Barnum searched the world for curiosities uh -oh. to intrigue his audiences, whether they were alive, dead, real, or fake. Oh, hang on. His business tactics included stunts, repetitive advertisement, and exaggerated publicity. As a oh, result, I guess we'll just get into it right here, guys. <laughs> including an international audience, and his showcase soon became a landmark. Some of Barnum's more successful museum exhibits included the Fiji mermaid, which seemingly was a human head attached to a finned fish of a body, when in reality it was later revealed to be a preserved head of a monkey sewn onto the preserved tail of a fish. Another real curiosity of the museum were the Siamese twins Chang and Eng. Barnum would often present... You know what, hang on guys, I screwed up here, hang curiosities, on. ...promoting racial othering in his museum. I screwed up here guys, give me one second here. Oh, I don't even know if I can do it. Let's see. Hang on. Oh, did I skip one? Maybe not. Nope, I did not. All right, here we go, guys. I got it figured out. Here we go. Amateur hour. <laughs> Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. This opening line delivered by Hugh Jackman in the 2017 film The Greatest Showman embodies the public sentiment of the circus in the late 1800s. Going on to perform the rest of the hit song to a packed tent full of eager onlookers, Jackman paints the audience a picture of what the circus meant to people during this That's time. a good movie. The promise of spectacle and wonderment, witnessing feats and performances never seen before. Truly living that was a big title, deal. I mean, think about show. how small of a society we had back you want then. Is right in front of you and you see the impossible is coming true. Today, we take a look at the dark side of P.T. Barnum. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, P.T. Barnum. Master showman, for sure. Barnum was born in 1810 in Bethel, Connecticut. His father died when P.T. was just 15 years old, leaving him as the main head of his household, largely responsible for the care of his mother and five siblings. While taking care of his family, he held a variety of jobs, and in 1831, he became the publisher of the Herald of Freedom, a weekly newspaper based out of Danbury, Connecticut. While running this newspaper, Barnum was arrested three times for libel. However, it is reported that he enjoyed these moments as they increased his notoriety. In 1829, he married Charity Hallett, and together they had four daughters. By 1834, he moved to New York City, where he started to become a showman of sorts. I love these old His footages like this. Was in 1835, where he presented Joyce Heth to the public. Heth was an elderly black woman who Barnum falsely advertised as George Washington's nurse, who would have been 161 <laughs> years old at the time. In 1842, Barnum acquired John Scudder's American Museum by outmaneuvering several wealthier bidders. The museum was a five-story structure, which was filled with stuffed animals, wax figures, and other typical museum exhibits. Barnum dramatically altered the museum into a collection of human curiosities, theatrics, beauty contests, and other such attractions. I love he played show. into the notion that humans were intrigued by all things unusual or bizarre. That is true. That is very true. Um, what do you guys think? Are you intrigued by oddities and that kind of stuff? Um, I definitely am. Like I said, at, at a young age, I'm like, I need to see this freak show. I need to see the snake man. I need to see George Washington's nurse. <laughs> uh, how horrible. 
you were just going to find some uh, old black lady and call her George Washington's nurse. Oh, I can't wait to see what some of the first stuff that he comes up with, guys. Um, all right, let's check this out. In doing so, Barnum searched the world for curiosities to intrigue his audiences, whether they were alive, dead, real, or fake. His business tactics included stunts, repetitive advertisement, and exaggerated publicity. As a result, his museum garnered the attention of many, including an international audience. And I was going to say, man, I mean, he did it right, so marketing-wise. museum exhibits included the Fiji mermaid, which seemingly was a human head attached to a finned fish of a body, when in reality, it was later revealed to be a preserved head of a monkey sewn onto the preserved tail of a fish. Huh. Another real curiosity of the museum were the Siamese twins Chang and Eng. Barnum would often present people yeah, these guys are like super famous. as living curiosities, promoting racial othering in his museum. In a similar vein, he presented a black man named William Henry Johnson as a creature known as the What Is It, as well as children from El Salvador as Aztecs. His most profitable exhibit was General <laughs> Tom Thumb, played by the 25-inch man Charles Stratton. He encountered Stratton at first when Stratton was four years old and just two feet tall. Barnum Dang. made an agreement with the child's parents, altered his age to 11, and then gave him the name General Tom Thumb. Stratton was somewhat of a performing prodigy, with Barnum teaching him how to dance, sing, do impersonations, and to swing a cane. In some performances, Barnum Talk would enter the museum up fast, a man. and audiences would bombard him, asking where Tom Thumb was. Then, Stratton would come out of an extra deep pocket in Barnum's coat and exclaim, Here I am, sir. After P.T. discovered Stratton and the exhibit became so popular, the two sold 20 million tickets to the museum Dang. and later embarked on a tour abroad. Where they 20 million the tickets? You gotta think about... Man, and that's all, major. The around 850,000 curiosities, whether genuine or fake. They were all presented in the same space and in the same context. He eventually gave up the museum in 1868, after two fires had come close to destroying it. In the time he ran the museum, 26 years in total, his showcase saw 82 million visitors. Daily, the museum saw over 4,000 visitors paying 25 cents per visit. Some famous audiences included William and Henry James, Charles Dickens, and Edward VII, the then Prince of Wales. Dang. And in addition to Queen Victoria, Tom Thumb and Barnum gave a presentation to Abraham Lincoln. Holy crap. So this was major, man. Like, you, you 20 million tickets back then? Woo! Man, that's just a moving. That's, I mean, wow. You got to think of how spread out the United States was. Oh, man, this is before they even were rolling with the circus, too. That's just crazy. Dang. All right, let's see what else we got. Go. Uh, oh, it's this one, I think. Yeah, here we go. P.T. later spent his entire fortune to import Jenny Lind, a Swedish soprano, to the United States. Before this, he had never seen or heard the singer, and she was mostly unknown in the U.S. He dubbed Lind the Swedish Nightingale and attempted his largest publicity campaign yet. Huh, just for a singing night woman? In New York City filled a capacity audience of 5,000 people, and she spent nine months performing in the U.S., earning significant profit. During the peak of his career, Barnum was well-known, and his appearance was almost as familiar to the public as were his exhibits. He was tall, six feet, two inches, pot-bellied, semi-bald, and had blue eyes and a bulbous nose. He called himself the Prince of Humble. Is he me? Close oh. friends of his defined him as good-natured, thoughtful, kind, though also stingy and egotistical. Later, he would go on to serve two terms in the Connecticut State Legislature. Oh, dang, I didn't as know that. Of Bridgeport. He briefly considered running for president towards the end of his life. Dang. In 1855, he published his first autobiography titled The Life of P.T. Barnum, written by himself. Remember, egotistical. Critics were harsh <laughs> about the publication, mainly because in the book, Barnum frankly reveals some of his deceits. Because of these critics, Barnum constantly modified and revised the book, and claimed to have sold a total of one million copies. He also placed the autobiography in the public domain in 1884. Is that P.T. Barnum math, though? <laughs> this would allow anyone to print and sell the book with no copyright infringement. Though most popularly associated with the circus, Barnum did not actually become a circus showman until he was over 60 years old. On April 10th, 1871... Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like it was all museum. museum. Menagerie, Caravan, and Circus opened in Brooklyn. The show was created after circus managers W.C. Coop and Dan Costello proposed a collaboration with Barnum, who jumped on the chance to transform his old museum into the greatest show on earth. He recruited many of his old performers and scouted new acts to include in the circus. He stated, greater than anything he had ever done, it will be the largest group of wonders ever known. My great desire is to totally eclipse all other exhibitions in the world. Dang. He secured the New York Hippodrome, 
a venue later known as Madison Square Garden, as a permanent site for the show. He later partnered with James A. Bailey, who ran the Great London Show, and helped elevate the circus spectacle to its greatest popularity of all time, attempting to make the circus what he would call the greatest show on earth. Yeah, that definitely became that, too. So that was the partnership between uh, P.T. Barnum and Bailey um, that gives you the Barnum and Bailey Circus, guys. Actually, they're still uh, moving around. I just saw a uh, advertisement for him. Funny. We, throw, we mentioned it on the show, and then all of a sudden I started getting ads. Um, they're uh, going to be in Vegas um, this year. Might have to go check that out, do a live from there. Um, but, yeah, so that's how he started with the circus part of it. Definitely uh definitely a con man per se. <laughs> All right, so was it this one here? I think so. The idea of combining Barnum's show with Bailey's was reached after Barnum realized the successful British show was encroaching on the American market. Upon meeting Bailey, Barnum recalled Ah, oh, so he did it showman, worthy of my steel. Yep. One of their most successful ventures together was the purchasing of Jumbo the Elephant, whose appearances grossed $336,000. In 1887, Barnum and Bailey divided the combined show into an equal partnership and named the show the Barnum and Bailey Greatest Show on Earth. In 1873, Barnum's wife Charity died after 44 years of marriage. However, oh, one year later, Barnum married Nancy Fish, who was 24, while Barnum was 64. That's convenient. By the time Barnum was 81, he became severely ill. He asked a New York newspaper to publish his obituary in advance so that he could read it himself, and he eventually died two <laughs> weeks later in 1891 oh, talk after about first a... inquiring about box office receipts for his circus. That's funny. The Times of London published the Egotistical. following in their paper. He created the metier of a showman on a grandiose scale. He early realized that essential feature of a modern democracy, its readiness to be led to what will amuse and instruct it. His name is a proverb already. In a proverb, it will continue. Wow, that's After a good his death, obituary. the circus he ran with James Bailey would continue to be managed by Bailey for years. Eventually, economic impacts and wartime conditions forced the show to combine with the Ringling Brothers Circus, which had become the leaders in the industry after Bailey's death. The combined show became known as The Greatest Show on Earth in 1919, and in total, ran for 146 years. Wow. Historian Daniel Borstein wrote that, contrary to popular belief, Barnum's great discovery was not how easy it was to deceive the public, but rather how much the public enjoyed being deceived. Author of Barnum in American Life, Robert Wilson posits in his book that Barnum's success lied in his belief that the public was willing and eager to be conned, and gained success from this belief more significantly than anyone before. Yeah. By the 1850s, Barnum had become one of the most wealthy men in the United States and a prominent social player in New York City. As already made clear, P.T. Barnum's career was not the most ethical or honest. He lied and deceived the public and often showcased racist exhibitions as well as presentations that included animal cruelty. His first public showcase of racism goes all the way back to his initial presentation of Joyce Heth. Barnum purchased Heth for yeah, it's a little racist. Despite slavery being <laughs> but hey, that time, that place, right? And despite this, no one objected to the sale. And to recap, Joyce was marketed as George Washington's nurse at 161 years old. Yeah, so <laughs> old P.T. Barnum, you know, I mean, he did what he had to do. I mean, you know, was it racism back then? I mean, now we can look at it from uh, you know clean eyes and be like, yeah, that's pretty freaking racist. But I mean. Under those eyes and that time, is it? I mean, was it? I mean, it is now, definitely. Um, we don't need to get into that whole discussion. But, yeah, um, yeah, he did some questionable stuff. But you got to think, um, you know, the pe uh, I, long story. <laughs> Let's finish this up, guys. To further sell the idea that Joyce was 161, Barnum decided to have Joyce's teeth pulled, as that would be more believable oh. and realistic for an older woman at her age to have significant teeth loss. He kept her on a rigorous schedule of 12 to 14 hour days, and when Heth's health began to visibly decline, Barnum announced a final tour of her showcase to rake in the last bit of money he could. When Joyce yeah, had he dead wasn't dead, a according nice to man. Barnum's autobiography, he said, I shed tears upon her humble grave, not of sorrow for her decease, but of regret on account of having lost a valuable and profitable curiosity. Barnum held a public autopsy and got away with this because of the alleged Joyce. She was seen as a possible scientific case to explore why she had lived so long, which of course was made up. 1,500 spectators paid 50 cents to see the dead woman cut up, revealing she was half her supposed age. In addition, at one point during a failed run for Congress, Barnum confessed to having owned slaves. He expressed remorse about oh, his dang. Victim, but it certainly adds to the deeply racist act of his shows. 
After admitting he owned slaves, he also said, I did more. I whipped my slaves. I ought to have been whipped a thousand times for this myself. But by then I was a Democrat, one of those nondescript <coughs> Democrats who are northern <laughs> men with southern principles. Remember that the modern notion of Democrats and Republicans was effectively inverted at this time. Yeah. Barnum's animal cruelty could be seen in his use of exotic animals in his shows. During this time period, the restrictions and protections for exotic animals were limited and almost non-existent. While not the first American to source exotic animals to the United States for entertainment value, he the was first the most king. notorious. <laughs> his biggest spectacle was Jumbo, an African elephant, who became the circus mascot. But despite Jumbo being the mascot for Barnum's show, he wasn't treated quite like a star. Jumbo was being fed booze-soaked biscuits from when he was a young calf in London Zoo. Aww. Soon, he would only become docile and easy to work with when he consumed alcohol. On September 15th, 1835, Jumbo was struck and killed by a train in St. Thomas, Ontario, California. Barnum knew even after death, Jumbo would still carry in a profit, so he had a taxidermist stuff his most prized star. Damn. Another notable instance of animal abuse was when in 1865, Barnum's American Museum burned to the ground and fleeing animals jumped from its windows, trying to escape. According to PETA, two captive whales fell to their death as the building burnt down. Damn. That's crazy. The release of The Greatest Showman musical movie in 2017 put P.T. Barnum back in the spotlight and brought into question how well do we really know this famous showman. His rags to riches story is one many turn to and idolize, that is, until you take a look behind the velvet curtain. He saw the market value for creating spectacle and making a profit on rumor and intrigue. Barnum created this world of fantasy and spectacle that audiences craved for entertainment, where people could come to escape their day-to-day -day lives and see exotic performances come to them. Barnum had the benefit of the times on his hands, profiting on prejudices and exploiting people with disabilities and enslaved humans, despite the fact that he supported the 13th Amendment. Looking back now through a modern day lens, the magic and spectacle that P.T. So, yeah, guys. P.T. Barnum. You know, they didn't get into a lot of the other stuff, like that carny life. But I guess that was kind of after P.T. Um, you know, he started the circus, but then... Um, you know, past not too far. Oh uh, man, you can start getting into some of that, uh, you know, the carny life and the murders and people missing, and there's a whole other thing to it. But that's more about the circus and P.T. Barnum himself. Was he a con man? Yes. Was he a liar? Yes. Was he a racist? Yes. <laughs> Did he become the greatest showman on earth? Yes. I don't know how those things. Uh, you know, balance out, guys. But you know, he uh, he added to the American flair. He, um, you know, you know the racist stuff. Like I said, it, it, that's you know walking a thin line at the time. Um, you know, animal cruelty. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can get into. Did he entertain millions upon millions? Yes. Um, you know, in the end. When he passed, he had the answer for what he did. And I uh, thought us to judge. Um, we weren't there. We weren't even born yet. So let's, uh, let's uh, you know, let, uh, whatever P.T. Barnum's doing now, you know, he uh, he's living, uh, he's paying for it in karma. So that's, that's rest assured. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you guys so much for watching. That was True Crime Thursday. How fascinating, like uh, the, the different things, General Tom Thumb, um, the mermaid that was a monkey tied to a fish body. I mean, different things. You know, people want to be entertained. People want to be mesmerized and amazed at different things. So, you know, he just played into that. And especially we were naive as a society back then. And he was able to, you know, play on our emotions, play on our unknown. You know, our lack of knowledge, our ignorance, if you will. Um, you know, the best thing we could do is, uh, you know, not take everything at face value and, uh, you know, do our own research. We got the Internet. We got all sorts of stuff, guys. And that's why you're not seeing a lot of this different stuff anymore. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. Kingman Crew, Teresa Deller, Usual Suspects, Lonnie, Mike, everyone in here. What's up, Jeremy? Bad Culinary, everyone who's in here, guys. Hopefully I didn't miss Anthony. What's up? Um, everyone in here, guys. Uh, it's my daughter's 18th birthday. I'm headed out to uh, help her celebrate it. So I'm going to get out of here, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. 
And hey, guys, check out 710 tomorrow. It's Friday. We're going to have a baked and unboxed uh, at 420. And we're getting into some BAM boxes, two of them, guys. We've got some good giveaways to give out. So make sure you're tuning in to that. We're going to go live at 710 for our 710 show. And it's a blast. If you guys haven't checked it out, super interactive. Uh, we're going to start doing a game show on there where I'm going to have uh, people call in on a video chat. And we're uh, basically like a morning show, a trivia type thing. So um, I'm trying to work out the analytics on that. But, man, that's going to be fun, guys. So uh, make sure you're checking out the 710 show, the 420 show, the Baked and Unbox, all the stuff we're doing, guys. Make sure you're checking out the DailyDank.com. Wild weekly drops have dropped, guys. So make sure you're checking that out. All right. We will see you guys um, at 710. See you guys. Thank you for joining us on the It's 420 Somewhere podcast. Broadcasting worldwide and brought to you by thedailydank.com. Check out our merchandise and amazing content. And follow us on all our social media. Now, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here.